the radio feed. So that way we got that underway because Lord knows that we need to start the radio feed in order to get it to the radio stations. Yeah, it's true. Hard to believe, but that's the way technology works. And uh, Dal Boop, always a pleasure to have you here, beautiful. Flash forward, what's happening? The gorgeous Jenny, nice to see you. And uh, let's see, Double Tim, what's happening, buddy? Good to have you here. We are 20 seconds away. Remember, the Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Also, if you're brand new here, please do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell. We are literally here seven days a week for your entertainment needs. And, of course, thank you to all the veterans who are tuning us in, as well as all of our regulars who show up and hang out with us as we talk about the strange, weird world that we live in, and we absolutely love it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, or thumbs down, my new Facebook friend, Sweet Morbidly Bear! There she is. Flash forward, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Really appreciate it. Rooted in gorgeous sacredness, and here we go, everyone. Get your horns up, because it's time for Mr. Bumblefoot. mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show at our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Man, do we have a great show for you. Literally a living legend in the field of ufology. Larry Holcomb's introduction into the world of UFOs came in the late 1950s after reading two of Major Donald Keogh's books, Flying Saucers Are Real and Flying Saucers from Outer Space. A year later, after watching Keogh debate an Air Force officer on the old Armstrong Circle Theater and seeing Keogh being censored when he deviated from the prepared script the Air Force forced on the show's producers, Larry was convinced the United States Air Force was covering up knowledge of UAP. Those started a 50-plus year avocation into the study and research of the UFO phenomena. And right now, Mr. Larry Holcomb has a brand new book out, Presidents and UFOs, and we are so glad to have him here. Mr. Larry Holcomb, a legend among legends in the UFO world. We are so happy to have you here on Spaced Out Radio. How are you? I'm fine, Dave. It's uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, I don't know this... Uh, this legend business, but uh, uh, I'm old enough to be a legend. Whether I am or not, I don't know. (laughs) Well, when you put 60 years of your life into the study of UFOs, I think it's pretty safe to say, my friend, that you are a living legend. So I am going to be referring to you as such tonight. And just don't blush too much and don't reach through the screen and smack me across the head if you don't mind. No problem. Let's go back to that Donald Kehoe. What captivated you about Donald Kehoe and his books on UFOs? Well, they were uh, they were true. They were he was speaking from his inner self, and there was no question. I knew that that uh, Kehoe had come on board uh as a as a skeptic uh he really didn't want to uh dive into the subject but his publisher uh really pushed him to do it once he got into it 
And Keogh had a lot of contacts in the Pentagon uh, back then. And uh, his, uh, uh, his zest, his zeal for what he was finding out was, uh, it just drew me to him. Uh, he was very believable. That's the bottom line. Kehoe was very believable. And, uh, so I, uh, I gravitated toward him and, uh, his books, uh, got me going. I, that was a, I was a junior or a senior in high school when all of that started. <clears throat> so, uh, Kehoe was the inspiration. There's no, no question about it. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know, many people don't know this, but, uh, Kehoe, uh, his, uh, publisher, uh, Henry Holton Company wrote a letter to the Air Force Public Information Office and uh, asked them, the Air Force, through the Public Information Office, if or how they regarded Kehoe. And um, I can't quote exactly what the uh, reply was, but the reply back to Henry Holt and Company, and this was before they published his book, the reply back was, uh, we in the Air Force are well aware, well aware of Major Kehoe. We know that he is a responsible journalist. Uh, we respect him. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then they went on to say, we understand that Major Kehoe believes that these flying objects are extraterrestrial in nature. Uh, we uh, don't necessarily buy into that, but we don't uh, think it's impossible either. Now, they are my words. They uh, it chops a lot of us much better. But in essence, he was seeing the Air Force at that time, 1952, was uh, looking at this subject as possible uh, extraterrestrial. The outcome of that, and the interest, really interesting part of it, is when Kehoe's book came out, uh, the first book came out, and I can't remember if that was Flying Saucers from Outer Space, or I, there were a couple of a couple of books. I can't remember exactly the title, but this book had the letter from Al Chop, head of public information for the Air Force, the very letter that he wrote printed in total on the back cover of the book. I don't think Al Chop knew that was going to happen, but it, it did, and uh, it caused quite a stir. But I, I think that's a very uh, little-known fact about uh, uh, about the subject of UFOs. Uh, uh, Al Chop was a pretty interesting person, and as it turned out, he shared Kehoe's views. Uh, there's an excellent movie. Uh, I can't recall. The, I can't recall. I think it's UFOs uh, or something. But anyway, it was uh, it was a pretty good movie, and it uh, really was about Al Chop and his life as uh, with the Air Force as public information officer. So, interesting, uh, very interesting guy. Looking back on six decades of UFOs, how has this subject 
really changed for you over the years from people seeing flying saucers to all these different shaped craft finding out there's government cover-ups to what we see happening today both with uh, the new york times article and the way social media has really influenced the growth of this subject uh in in one respect uh, we haven't seen the change that we'd like to see. On the other side, uh, what has come about recently is uh, pretty groundbreaking uh, uh, events on this subject. Now, I was a little disappointed when the New York Times article came out. It made a big splash. Uh, uh, really around the world, uh, but certainly in the United States. And, but it, as happens, as has happened so often in the UFO uh, issue, it went away. No, it, with all of the evidence and everything that was being said, it sort of dried up. Now, uh, I guess I was expecting a big explosion to happen when all of this was revealed. And it didn't happen, but what has happened is there is a great deal more uh, well, let put it this way. After 2017, we started taking giant steps rather than baby steps in this subject. Uh, and uh, it's still going on. We're still, it may not have progressed as fast as I thought it was going to, but it, ha it has moved ahead uh, in a major way uh, from what uh, it had been doing over the years. Another, another thing to keep in mind, uh, in the 70 plus years that this subject has been in the people's minds of some level, it has never been disproved. And if you think about that, that's rather remarkable uh, that the subject is still alive and not holding its own, but it's growing. So uh, I don't know of any other uh, government involved project, if you will, that hasn't been uh, proven to be uh, a an accurate program uh, that has always been uh, uh, openly discussed and has uh well i'm i'm searching for the right word but that that has been uh, an open subject uh that has not been dismissed or has not been told about such as the stealth fighter the stealth bomber uh then going back to other government uh uh, projects that were at the time top secret uh, but they've all been re revealed uh, not all not present day stuff but the UFO issue the UFO problem if you will uh, is still alive and well it has never been disproved it's had its critic critics and it's had its uh, debunkers but it's still 
over 70 years has not been disproved, disproved, and I think that says a great deal about the subject. For you, what's the biggest mystery outside of the government coming back and saying, ladies and gentlemen, UFOs and aliens are real? What's the biggest mystery over the last 60 years that you're either disappointed that hasn't been solved yet or that just continues to scratch your head that you can't figure it out? Well, there's a great many of them. I'm, I, uh, I have, uh, I believe <clears throat> that we're dealing with a extraterrestrial presence. Now, whether the craft are occupied or, or are probes that are controlled from elsewhere, uh, I don't know. But it's, it's uh, uh, the fact that, well, that we... Uh, again, I'm searching for the right word, but uh, it's, it's, uh, well, do I have a, uh, do I have a one particular case that I'm, uh, particularly wrapped up in? And that would be, of course, would be Roswell, uh, which I've spent, uh, so much time with. And I think with a question, Roswell was an extraterrestrial event. Um, all the, uh, all the, the, the information, all of the data, all of the people that have witnessed it, that witnessed it. Of course, most of those have passed on now, but we still have their, uh, what they said and what they believed. So I think Roswell is, is still remains uh, as as far as the U.S. Uh, U.S. goes uh, the uh, the top of the pyramid, so to speak. Now there are another uh, uh, several other really great sightings. The uh, uh, Japan Airlines sighting in Alaska. Uh, is hard to explain. Um, the uh, let's see uh, the the uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, missile launch that apparently was attacked by UFOs. And filmed by Robert Jacobs, I believe it was. Uh, I think is another extremely interesting case, and of course Bob Salas's case uh, at uh, uh, Minot, uh, North Dakota, uh, is really a case you can't dispute unless you say that. Uh, Bob wasn't uh, had made the story up, and that's ridiculous because I know Bob, and he's uh, he's straight as an arrow. So uh, those cases, I guess, are the ones that I, in, as far as the U.S. goes, and there are many others. There's the uh, the RB forty seven flight uh, back in. Uh, it was the fifties or the sixties, I believe. But in any way, uh, there are plenty of plenty of good sightings, and there are plenty of bad sightings that I I'm very skeptical of. Uh, although I believe that we are being visited by an extraterrestrial presence. Uh, I'm also a skeptic of a great deal of what people say, and it's uh, it's always been amazing to me why people make up stories. They 
about UFOs. I guess it won't notoriety or whatever, but it's it damages uh, genuine uh, ufology and research. Uh, with a question, it's done a great deal of harm over the years, and they're still out there. You know, they're still uh, debunkers making excuses for the uh, uh, film that was re- released through the uh, uh, To the Stars Academy. Uh, and, you, you know, I don't know how the debunkers, the, well, your excuse alarm, me. Your alarm's going off there. That isn't the UFOs yeah. flying in, is it? No, that's okay. a Amber Alert. Uh, anyway, uh, I uh, lost my train of thought, so go ahead. And- well, I, I want to ask you, I mean, you, you brought up uh, Robert Salas and, and the whole nuclear event. You brought up uh, a lot of uh, different old stories about the history that of, of some of the most popular cases in ufology, in, in your opinion, what do these extraterrestrials want? What, what do you think their, their goal is here? Is it just experimentation and scientific knowledge of another inhabited planet? Or do you think that, you know, that it goes way deeper than that? Well, I don't like to speculate. Uh, I'd, I'd rather have hard facts but in this business of ufos there are very few hard facts and that leads to speculation so uh if i had to pin down uh one thing one belief why why we're being visited uh, is because they're concerned about our involvement uh, in nuclear warfare and nuclear development. Now, you can really take this subject and go back to biblical times you know there's some people that say that uh, we were placed here Uh, we were placed here on this planet uh, by extraterrestrials now certainly have no proof of that there's uh, a lot of circumstantial evidence that uh, comes from back from biblical times uh, things that have been left, things that really uh, can't be explained uh, such as uh, Puma Punke which fascinates me Uh, of course the pyramids and uh, a number of other things that it's just not reasonable to say that uh, these people back then had the ability to construct these structures and uh, buildings and what have you. It's just, especially, I, I keep referring to Puma Punke because I think that's a uh, uh, a real telltale that we were dealing uh, that there was something here there of that was really extraordinary uh, that allowed these massive structures to be uh, built and uh, manufactured in a way that I'm not sure we could do it now. 
Right, and sir, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Legendary UFO researcher Larry Holcomb is here looking into the history of ufology, which will continue right after this, the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio next. Stay tuned. And we're clear. This is so exciting. So exciting. Hello, ufologist. Hi, John Poe. Hi, President. No, we can't nuke Switzerland. They're, they're going right there. If you want to... The Dutch, maybe. Okay, well, I'll give you a reason for the Dutch, but not Switzerland. They, they make good watches and pocket knives. Fabster, what's happening? And uh, there's Low Pro joining us. And who else? The gorgeous and talented Teresa has returned. Hi, Nikki. The lovely psychic of Seattle. And, uh, yeah, we're caught up now. You having fun yet, boss? Mr. H, you having fun? Oh, yeah. Good. Oh, yeah, I'm... Uh... I had to stumble around a bit, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm getting my sea legs. The, uh, one point I wanted to bring up, which I'll do when we come back on, is, uh, the, uh, business of a comms razor. Yes. And, uh. Uh, how the uh, uh, debunkers use that. And I think it's uh, exactly the opposite way around. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, look at the path of the least resistance or the most uh, logical explanation, you come back to the extra terrestrial events uh, or extraterrestrial visitation I, I think that's uh, uh, to me that's clear now the debunkers like to use it but uh, when you have all of the background that we've got that it's coming out now uh, how can you uh, how can you say that uh, anything but the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the most logical explanation? Have you ever seen an ET? Uh, well, yes, one time. Uh, I don't talk about it because it's, uh, for one thing, it's not a very sexy sighting. But, yes, I, it was a sighting I couldn't explain. Uh, and uh, do you want me to go into it? I would love, uh, you know what, I'll ask you that on the show. I'll ask okay. you that on the show. Because that, that'll be good. And uh, yeah. I, I've been face-to-face with two extraterrestrials and i have never been more scared in my life and uh it's a cool scared man it is a very cool scared and i would <laughs> love to go through it again i really would uh my wife was away from my house at the time and uh, when she got back, she found all the doors locked. So uh, it was, uh, it unnerved me. Did you, did you ever meet Philip Kraft? He used to write for the L.A. Times and then had his major experience? Uh, and, no. And ended up writing a three novel chapter or three novel uh, story about his contact uh, with the Verdans. Uh, it was, the story still blows me away. 
the name's familiar, but I can't yeah. remember. He passed away. What? He passed away a number of years ago. Yeah. Hi, ravishing Rachel Rodriguez. How are you? Yeah, I mean that story stunned me because him and I had very uh, similar backgrounds. Uh, both journalists. I, I worked in radio. He worked in, you know, much longer at the L.A. Times, um, and kind of went from there. And then out of nowhere, just started having experiences. Uh, give, we got about 20 seconds here, boss. Thank you to Cat Chaser and Flash Forward for the awesome super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Big thank you to all the veterans who are tuning us in. We absolutely love you. You always have a safe home here. And, of course, all our regulars, we always love you guys here, including that Chad Smith guy. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with legendary UFO researcher, writer, author, Larry Holcomb. Imagine 60 years of research this gentleman has under his cowboy hat, which... I'm, I'm not going to lie, Larry, you, you know, you got this gorgeous picture of yourself wearing your your cowboy hat, your Stetson there, and I was hoping for you to have it on tonight, and it's not there. Uh, I'm a little I probably hurt. would have, except uh, wearing this headset. True. Very true. I get you there. I'll give you that one. I will give you that one. Now, right I, do before- like to, I do like to cover the... Uh, Chrome boom up when I'm giving lectures, so I'll wear a hat doing uh, doing that. Uh, uh, I guess it's a little uh, on the uh, I don't know ego side that I don't want uh, people to see that I'm bald, but I am. So what difference does it make? I'm wearing a wig too, so you know, just so that way everybody knows I'm wearing a wig. Not really, but just to make. I didn't think so. I can lend you some if you need. I can. I got lots. You know, but let's get back to what we were talking about right before the break. You know, you wanted to make kind of an example of Occam's Razor here regarding the U.S. government, what they know, what people know, what researchers know. And there's a fine line between everything that's going on right now, probably even the thinnest that it's ever been. What do you think is happening here? Well, uh, it's hard to tell what the government really knows. And, you know, this subject has so many roots and branches that go in all sorts of directions. Um, Does the government um, really know? Is the government, uh, uh, does the government have... uh, uh, artifacts of crashed extraterrestrial craft. Um, there is reason to believe that they do, uh, because Luis Alex- Elizondo said that the government did have uh, this material uh, on someone's show. I don't know. I can't recall what it was, but he did say he was asked that question, and uh, and he he replied in the uh, positive that the government does have uh, exotic materials. Uh, uh, so 
anyway, that's that's uh, what I what I think is one other thing I wanted to say is we talk about a comms razor and a lot of debunkers use that as uh, as uh, proof or as a, a strong case that uh, the UFO subject is not extraterrestrial. It's all uh, prosaic, uh, uh, whatever, sightings, whatever. Now, in my opinion, if you use Occam's razor's theory, that the most logical explanation is the correct explanation where we have uh, the data that we now have, legitimate data, the film strips that were uh, released uh, in 2017 and then verified as authentic by the Pentagon, uh, when you put that and a lot of other uh, uh, issues together, uh, in my opinion, you you come up with the most logical, reasonable explanation is uh, is the extraterrestrial. Uh, theory. Uh, I just I don't see how anybody can look at it any other way. The 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 performance of these craft are far beyond anything that we have uh, today. Uh, I'm sure that there are projects uh, being tested in the desert or. The, Western Desert uh, that are probably 50 years or so ahead of what we know about. But 50 years ahead doesn't uh, come close to what we are seeing these objects do. Uh, So I just... uh, I think that we've gotten to a point where it's very difficult to go against the extraterrestrial hypothesis. A lot of the debate that has happened from Lou Elizondo and others is the fact that we, Larry, have have heard many of them say we don't know where these beings, if we could call them that, or craft, are coming from. We don't know if it's from the future. We don't know if it's from space, if it's from another timeline, a different dimension, inner earth, the ocean, and they've always been here. There seems to be a a large, large uh, contingency on trying to figure out where these craft and or potentially beings are coming from. Now, we all assume it's from space, but how do you look at that debate after 60 years? Well, uh, in my early years of the uh, subject, I was convinced, as Keyhole was, that they were extraterrestrial in nature. And I still believe that. I think that's the... I think that's the the logical uh, approach. However, I don't rule out time travel. I don't rule out um, uh, extra or uh, uh, dimensional issues. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, I've uh, listened to. Dr. Mikio Keiku discuss it, and I still don't understand it, but uh, 
it's it's uh i i think that that uh we've gotten better at understanding what these things probably are now let me stop and say i don't know what the government knows uh i don't have any idea uh well i take that back i do have an idea but uh the the government you got one you got two issues to consider uh number one the government is concerned from a standpoint of national defense because we have objects now that the government admits can fly through our sovereign airspace uh, that's not they're not impeded in any way we don't have the ability to stop them so that's a great concern on the other side of the issue and I tend to to believe in this that there is a small group of people uh, in the government or in uh, industry high-ranking industry uh, government contractors that know a great deal more about this than is being told. Uh, uh, but in any, either case, uh, we know now with the government's admission that these objects are are real and uh, they're not uh, uh, something that's visionary or or uh, whatever. Uh, so I don't rule out time travel, uh, extraterrestrial visitation, uh, or the dimensional issue. Uh, I think they're all in play until we uh, until we find out something differently. Do you think that U.S. government, especially, knows more than what they are admitting? Because everybody seems to be playing a little stupid here. You know, basically saying we don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what their technology is. We haven't seen anything like this before. And it seems like I'm one of the few who has said to my audience, they've been knowing for 70-plus years since Roswell. They have a lot of information. They're holding it back. And if they did open up to what they did know, this would open up a Pandora's box for all humanity to find out what's been held back from us for this many decades. What is your thoughts on that? Well, um, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, uh, we have the government, uh, some small group within the government knows a great deal. Uh, I think the spokesmen that we hear from are told what to say, uh, and they do re really don't know. Uh, but there is there is a group uh, within the government uh, that and it, it could be made up of government people and uh, military contractors. Uh, military contractors uh, like TRW Systems and uh, Raytheon and so on, they have the ability to conceal and ha and maintain classifications probably better than our own government does. Uh, so um, I, I think that, uh, well, that we are, uh, 
we're we're on the verge of making some great breakthroughs uh, with uh, what the government knows, but how quickly that's coming, and if it we're if it's going to be revealed in some sort of higher level or if it's going to be dribbled out to us um, which seems to be what's happening now uh, I don't know but I think that within the government there is a very select uh, small group of people uh, that do know Excuse me. That's okay. It, that is an oh. Amber Alert. If you want to read that out, uh, since we are a media company, that that I'm okay with that. Well, I just I just cut it off. But anyway, all right. Uh, 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 where are we? But anyway, the uh, I find it I find it difficult to believe otherwise I just I think it's not within the realm of reason uh, to believe um, that the government some part of the government deep within the government uh, knows a great deal about this story uh they're, they're, that they're not revealing. Uh, and it could be for any number of reasons. Uh, yeah, for uh, Because these, uh, these objects, these people, uh, are entities that are in or that are extraterrestrials um, have a uh, a great deal of well I think that the government has a great deal of information on them on a very limited knowledge and the spokesman that we hear on television this and people at press conferences uh, they're tell they're they're not in the know they're telling uh, what they're told to tell and uh, you know my research uh, has shown that high-ranking officers high-ranking military officers, uh, uh, generals, admirals, uh, uh, by and large, if they don't have a need to know, if there's not really a need to know, they don't know. Uh, I have a friend that uh, is a retired uh, Air Force bird colonel, and uh, of course, when he came up, he made a lot of friends, and a lot of his friends are now uh, general officers or retired general officers. And he knows my interest in the subject, uh, and he's talked with his friends, these general officers, uh, two-star, three-star, one four-star. And they told him that they just didn't know, that they were fascinated by the subject, but they didn't really have any information on it. I'll take that back. There was one two-star that was uh, had a high-level position in uh, NORAD, and he didn't he cut the conversation off quickly, according to my friend. He didn't want any parts of it. And uh, if anybody uh, in the government, in the military, uh, 
uh, knows about uh, what goes on in our skies, uh, you would think that uh, a high-level officer in NORAD would be one of those people. So, uh, anyway, that's my take, that we just, uh, the government has people that are talking their, their line and they don't know, but there is a core group that does know and uh, knows a great deal more than they're, they're telling us now. Why the secret, though? After 70 years, why continue to spread the I don't know profile? Is it that way high up in top secret uh, affairs that they really don't want a lot of these generals or, or admirals or, or even colonels to know? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a given. Uh, people talk, even people that hold high security clearances, uh, they talk. And the only way this secret could have been kept is to have the highest level of security possible. I mean, many steps above top secret, uh, top secret code words and the code words let several some people know one thing and another code word lets other people know something else and you could have two people working side by side in the same building and on highly classified data but one would know what the other one's doing so uh yeah, I think that it it's, has been worked out over the years since Roswell. Uh, uh, our security has, our government has learned really how to manage uh, high security. Uh, and uh, they just don't, if you don't have a need to know, you don't know. You may be uh four star general right. but if you don't have a need to know you don't know now i don't know how high that goes uh my impression is uh from my work on the presidents and ufos is uh it's very questionable whether the president is be- is being told everything um uh, I I think first of all it has to do who the, it has to do with who the president is how much the intelligence community can trust this president you know he's in office for maximum 8 years so uh it's certainly conceivable to think that the real background of this is has been kept away from some presidents. I would think Harry Truman uh, probably was extremely well versed in the subject, uh, as was Eisenhower. Those two were in what I call the golden years of uh, ufology i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna get, ask you one question right there and i apologize we only got about 30 seconds left here do you believe that eisenhower took part in that Grieta treaty in california uh no how do you make how do you make treaties with uh, uh extraterrestrials that may be a million years more advanced i mean what's a treaty worth treaties that we write with people here on Earth are not worth anything. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think this uh, treaty business is uh, is uh, very skeptical to me, anyway. Uh, all right, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. 
I'm telling you, we got a great show tonight. The legendary Larry Holcomb is our guest. 60 years in ufology. We're going to transition getting into his latest book, Presidents and UFOs, when we come back for Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio. So stay tuned. we got a great hour of information packed for you. We'll be right back. All right, we're clear. We got about six minutes here, boss. Well, uh, you know the good questions. It's uh, I have to do a lot of thinking. I'm not as young as I used to be, and things don't come to me too quickly. But uh, it's uh, uh, you're asking good, good probing questions, and that's that's always uh, that's always very good to have. Somebody that knows the subject is talking about. Well, you know, I uh, I put my pants on one leg at a time, as Stanton Friedman once told me. <laughs> you knew Stan, did you? Well, I only I never met him face to face. I didn't have that pleasure, but I remember. Uh, I'll tell you my first Stanton Friedman story. The first time I ever, ever interviewed him was around 2015 when I was just getting the the show started and. You know, Stanton, I, I kind of, I, I've never really, there's only been a couple times in my entire radio career that I ever froze. And the first one was Wayne Gretzky, when I interviewed Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> and then when I got out of radio, and you know, and then a few years later started up this show, I, um, I froze with Stanton. And at that time we were doing a, a, a recording of the of the uh, show, and I finally st- I butchered my interview. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't speak, and I finally stopped. And I said, "Sir, I hope you don't mind. I got to restart this, but I just got to get off the- this off my chest." I said, "I can't believe you're Stanton fucking Friedman, right?" <laughs> and and he just started killing himself laughing, and he goes, "Well, Dave, you know I." I put yeah. my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And it just kind of cut the whole tension and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, eased into the interview from there, which was really nice. But uh, I love the man. I mean, I never, I wish I would have met him personally, but hey, wasn't meant to be. Stan uh, uh, was a. Uh... Uh, people use this term a lot, but I think he was unique uh, in the field. Um, I talked to Stan a lot uh, when we were together in Roswell. I was uh, inv- I've been invited out to Roswell for to lecture and uh, to sell my book for uh, since 2011. So I spent a lot of time with Stan. Stan uh, was she, uh, I say unique, uh, probably that's the wrong word, but uh, uh, an overused word. But anyway, uh, he was a great listener. He listened intently to what you were saying, but he rarely revealed a great deal of himself and how he felt about various things and people. Uh, I had, I did get him to open up about a couple of people that he had had a bad experience with. But by and large, he didn't, he didn't really uh, show his real feelings. Kathy Barden told me the same thing. I was expla- uh, talking to her about that vote stand, and she said the same thing. He, as close as she was to Stan, uh, she said he he never would really open up to me uh, a lot of the time. So uh, anyway, he was uh, he was a brilliant guy. You know, he was a he was a member of Mensa, right? Uh, and uh, 
so he was uh, uh, quite uh, quite brilliant. He, you know, he, you know, he he went to college, University of uh, Chicago, with uh, uh, who am I thinking about? I lost a uh, uh, famous physicist. Uh, anyway, who? gave him the business about not uh, uh, Carl Sagan who gave him the business about not staying in school and getting his doctorate and Stan said the simple truth was I had to go to work I had to make some money and uh, so uh, he and uh, Carl Sagan were pretty good friends, although they disagreed on the UFO issue. But uh, yeah, Stan was a Stan was a neat guy, and like I told you earlier, yeah, I miss him very much. So I think the entire community misses him too. I mean, imagine how much we could use his opinion right now on everything that's going on because. He sure wouldn't be afraid to call the BS out on a lot of uh, the crap that we're seeing. That's for sure. We've only got about 30 seconds here. Big thank you to Cat Chaser and Flash Forward for amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis, so we really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's hit that thumbs up and subscribe button tonight. We really do uh, appreciate um, the support. Thank you to our regulars and all the veterans tuning on in. Get your horns up. Get ready. Here comes hour number two right now. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us on in wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us a favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Echopraxia. Echopraxia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with living UFO legend... Larry Holcomb, yes, 60-plus years in the field. He's got a brand-new book out, Presidents and UFOs. It's the third book he has written on this subject, but he is considered a well-known voice in the advocacy of UFO research. Larry, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Good to be back. What made you write this book, to get a little political inside this topic? Uh, uh, very simply, uh, what I wrote, a great deal of what I wrote in the book is known by most, uh, ufologists, researchers into the subject. But what I tried to do was explain to the public that has an interest in the subject, but not a deep knowledge of the subject and explain how our government has handled it, has handled the subject and how uh, deceitful uh, they've been. Uh, and uh, how many lies that they've told over the years. Uh, I remember uh, Bill Clinton uh, was very interested in the subject. Uh, so was Hillary. And uh, they were involved in the uh, Rockefeller Initiative. But uh, Bill came out and made it clear that he 
ask, uh, I think it was Webb Hubble, to uh, look into the Kennedy assassination and what he could find out about UFOs. Um, and he made several speeches after that. At that time, at that time when he was newly uh, in uh, inaugurated, uh, I really didn't think that he knew a great deal about uh, UFOs, the subject of UFOs in the background. Um, he wasn't told. I think that as time went on, he found out more and more. Uh, more was told to him, uh, and he became better versed on the subject. Uh, he, in one of the speeches he made, I think it was in Ireland. Uh, no, I'm getting that wrong. That was a that was a different speech. But he made a speech where he said that he had looked into and had his people look into the Roswell issue, and. Uh, they came back and said nothing to it. There's really nothing to it. Uh, then he said in that interview, I wouldn't be the first president, chief executive that uh, uh, full-time uh, 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 people within the uh, government uh, lied to the President of the United States. So, I mean, that's that's saying a bit. Uh, probably, uh, he was probably perhaps covering his backside a bit uh, at that statement. But uh, uh, anyway, I think it was somewhat of a telling statement that uh, uh, we know that government bureaucrats, high-level bureaucrats, have lied to the president. And he was uh, simply acknowledging that fact. Uh, so uh, in any case, I think that uh, we are we're dealing with a government that probably is scared uh, you were talking about earlier I think uh, why the government uh, would want to classify this uh, so highly uh, above top secret. Again, you can only speculate. Uh, you know, there could be a number of reasons. Uh, you know, people say uh, it's because the truth, the people are not ready for the truth of what we know is fact. Uh, is that the case? I don't know. It's very possible. Uh, I think it's, I think it's probably more probable that the government really didn't want to admit until they had to that our air, sovereign air space, space is being overflown by objects that they have no control over. Uh, that's sort of a, a sort of a scary thing. Um, then, to move a bit off of the subject, uh, it's it's a difficult thing to understand 
why uh, uh, the UFO subject is uh, is taken to uh, such extremes by uh, uh, to to keep the security up, and it's it it really it really is uh, uh, in sometimes hard to understand. But on the other hand, if uh, if the government uh, does know uh, uh, what is uh, could be really terrible. Uh, and I can't imagine what that would be because it appears these b- beings have been around a long time. But uh, I, I, I don't know. Again, it's so much in this subject, there's so much speculation that you can do without any real facts to back it up. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sure of where we are with the government. I just, I, I, it's, I've tried to figure it out and it's, it just doesn't, uh, I can't get a handle on it. Uh, so, well, what do you think that the government has from Roswell on forward? Do you think we have crash retrievals? Do you think we have bodies? Do you think, and I'll add a third question on there, do you think that the presidents are informed about the the capabilities of this presence? I think it depends on the president and the circumstances surrounding it. Uh, surrounding the particular event, uh, take the uh, 1952 uh, so-called Washington merry-go-round, uh, where the capital was, uh, for lack of a better word, invaded by uh, UFOs uh, on uh, a weekend night, which I forget the dates exactly, but a, a weekend night in July, a week or a weekend in uh, July, that the uh, uh, airspace, restricted airspace over the White House in the Capitol, uh, was overflown by these mysterious objects. Uh, Jets were scrambled, and uh, as they approached, the objects took off. The following weekend, uh, the same thing occurred on a Saturday night. Jets were scrambled, and in this case, they didn't leave. Uh, There's one recorded... uh, uh, pilot conversation back and forth uh, saying that they're closing in on me. They're getting closer. They're getting closer. They're right on top of me. What, a, what should I do? I guess he's saying, should he fire on them? Which would have not been a good choice. But in any case, within an instant, they took off and left. So this is a well-documented case. Uh, uh, the uh, head of uh, uh, public information for the Air Force, Al, Albert Chop, as I mentioned earlier, he was on the second night, the second weekend, he was in the tower, and he was observing what was going on on radar. Uh as was uh, radar uh, operators at uh, Andrews Air Force Base and Washington National, I believe. Uh, so uh, that was uh, that's been a very important case. Uh, Truman asked his uh, Air Force 
advisor to get all the information he could on the subject. Um, and he did. He got this information, and Truman uh, Truman understood uh, high security, high classifications, and he was he could be very closed mouth. He was uh, on some things. But uh, uh, so he Truman was uh, deeply involved in it. Uh, that was passed on to Eisenhower, uh, uh, not by Truman, because their relationship, Eisenhower's uh, relationship with Truman, or vice versa, uh, had become ice cold where uh, Eisenhower was chief of staff under Truman in the Army, but once he became a politician, then uh, things went downhill. Uh, And he, uh, uh, Eisenhower, well, the story goes that when Truman, when Eisenhower was being inaugurated, the protocol was uh, for the incoming president to go to the White House and have tea or coffee with the outgoing president. And uh, Truman set that up. But Eisenhower wouldn't get out of the car. He wouldn't go in to have uh, tea and crumpets or whatever. Uh, with the outgoing president and his wife, Bess. So they had a very rocky relationship. Now, however, the head of the CIA at that time uh, was General Walter Bedell Smith. And... uh, he was uh, um, he was Eisenhower's chief of staff uh, during the war, and so obviously they were very close. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Beetle Smith uh, clued Eisenhower in on everything the CIA knew about UFOs. Of flying saucers. So I think uh, Eisenhower was very well uh, uh, briefed on the uh, on the subject of UFOs and uh, probably knew it as well as Truman did. But I think those two people in the golden years of ufology, as I say, I think they were the uh, uh, prime movers and shakers of uh, uh, the president's background on UFOs. I think they, I think they all knew the full story. Um, then you go into Richard Nixon and how much he knew, and uh, of course he was Eisenhower was uh, vice president for eight years and how much he was involved in this also, it's hard to say. Uh, But anyway, and then you have Kennedy that came along, and Kennedy wanted to know. He wanted to release uh, all of the information that we had on flying saucers or UFOs. Um, And he asked the CIA, uh, CIA to give him all of the documents that they had because he was going to share it with the Russians, with the Soviets. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, it was Khrushchev uh, was supposed to do the same to us. 
to the U.S. USA. Uh, but that never happened. Uh, you know, Kennedy was assassinated, and uh, so that never came about. I want to ask Have you. A- I want to ask you in regards to Truman and Eisenhower. Every time we talk UFOs, it seems that we skip a lot of presidents and get right to Eisenhower and Truman. Do you think, and maybe in your research you know, I'm not too sure if you could even answer this question, but do you think with the involvement that these two had in UFOs and the the subject from Roswell on forward, do you think that these two really set the tone for future presidents on what a president should know or could know about UFOs? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, it's certainly possible, but I think it was, it's really been up to the intelligence community after Eisenhower to uh, tell the incoming presidents, uh, what level of information they were going to get on the subject. Uh, Kennedy wanted the information, and uh, it's clear to me uh, that the CIA didn't want to give it to him. Uh, Neither did NASA. Uh, So... But we don't know how that would have played out. Uh, Then, uh, moving ahead, uh, I think that Richard Nixon had a great deal of knowledge on the subject. Uh, So, to answer your question, I think it it simply goes back to how well uh, the president is the incoming president is trusted by the intelligence community and how much information they get and what they get is tightly controlled by this group. Uh, You know, I want to say Majestic 12. Uh, And I still believe uh, Majestic 12 existed whether it's uh, of the same name now i doubt it it is probably much larger uh but i think yeah that that did exist and i think that uh, uh well i know the truman set if it existed truman set it up had it set up uh and he was in charge of all the information, who would get it and who wouldn't. Um, uh, so, uh, going back to Nixon, I think that Nixon knew a great deal about it. I think the intelligence community trusted Nixon. He had been vice president for eight years under Eisenhower. How much information he had, I don't know, but he was certainly interested in the subject, uh, and especially his good friend Jackie Gleason was. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm sure, and it said that Gleason uh, pressed. Uh, uh, Nixon to uh, reveal what the government knew and in my book I won't go into it here but in my book is the story about uh, Nixon uh, and uh, his what appears to be his attempt or his desire to uh, expose 
the UFO issue, to disclose the UFO issue to the public. On that, um, on that note, I'm going to get you to hold on right there, Mr. Holcomb, as we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. We've got Mr. Larry Holcomb, 60 years of UFO knowledge for another 60 minutes here on Space Out Radio. We continue talking presidents and UFOs when we return on the Mighty SOR. All right, we're clear. Uh, good. Yeah, I, uh, the uh, the Nixon story is uh, pretty important to me because, uh, as you know from my book, I uh, I spent a lot of time with Bob Emmenager, right? Who made the uh, documentary film uh, UFOs past, present, and future, uh, which I think was one of the best documentaries uh, on the subject made, certainly at that time, in the mid-1970s. And uh, Bobby Emmenager was the, uh, well, he was uh, the co-producer of the, of the film. Uh, and uh, I think it's... Uh, I think it shows, uh, you know, without question that uh, Eisenhower or uh, uh, Nixon was on the on the road to disclosure. And if it had not been for Watergate, um, things could be a lot different now. Right. Well, we'll continue on from there. When we get back. Yeah, I really, uh, I enjoyed my relationship with Bob Emmenager. I don't know if Bob is still alive. I, I hope so. He was a very nice man. Uh, my wife and I stayed at his home. Uh, overnight when I interviewed him, very gracious. Uh, we did take him out to dinner, and he just uh, he just opened up. It was uh, it was quite interesting. Well, according according to uh, Google, he's still alive at eighty nine years old. Yeah, he was he was pretty hardy. Uh, uh, so um, I'm glad to I'm I'm glad to know that he is. Uh, I haven't uh, talked with him in quite a while, uh, which is my fault. But anyway, he's a good man, and uh, I was trying to think of his partner's name. Uh, which evades me right now. But anyway, the two of them worked together when they were going to get uh, information from the White House, from the Nixon administration, uh, through a contact named Paul Shartle. And uh, uh, it, it... it seemed to be that Nixon was fast on the way to some level of disclosure. And this could very, you know, this could very well have been uh, the result of uh, his uh, buddy Jackie Gleason beating on him to release this, uh, this information. So I don't know. Again, speculation. Uh, uh, so, you know, we could talk about that when things pick back up, when you pick back up. Uh, sure. And uh, uh, Gleason's ex-wife, uh, uh, 
Kendrick Gleason, uh, I'm trying to think of her first name, but uh, anyway, uh, Beverly, Beverly uh, McKendrick uh, Gleason tells the story of uh, Jackie. Uh, well, if, that, Nixon. If, if that's a story, I, I think I'm going to get you to hold on to that one. Okay. Not until we come back here. We only got about uh, uh, 35 seconds. Okay. Thank you to Cat Chaser and Flash Forward for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to... Uh, Support this show. Thank you to everybody who's hit that thumbs up or thumbs down. And, uh, we, yeah, we will get to Larry's experience as well here, so don't worry about that. Uh, Ripsaw, thank you for joining our chat. Veterans, thank you for your time and service. We appreciate it here on this show. Here we go. Past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with legendary UFO researcher Larry Holcomb. Over 60 years of research going into tonight and he's got a brand new book out presidents and ufos and he's talking about a a great story here between richard nixon the former president and former comedian jackie gleason fill us in larry well uh gleason uh was a well it's a good friend of nixon they played golf together when you know nixon had uh had a uh uh, summer home or a uh, vacation home in uh, Key Biscayne. And, of course, uh, Gleason lived in Miami and owned a golf course there, and uh, Nixon played it often with Gleason. Now, Gleason was a staunch believer in the uh, UFO phenomenon. Um and I, th- when Gleason passed away, I think he had something like uh, sixteen hundred books on the on UFOs and the paranormal that his wife donated to the University of Miami Library in Gleason's name. Anyway, it's uh, it's. Not hard to believe if if Gleason was so wrapped up in the UFO subject, and uh, so was Nixon to a certain degree, that uh, Gleason beat on Nixon so verbally, I'm sure in a nice way, but uh, to release government information on... UFOs, and uh, his former wife, uh, Beverly McKittrick Gleason, uh, was, after Gleason's death, was going to, I think it was after Gleason's death, uh, was going to write a tell-all book, and in the book, she told of Richard Nixon picking Gleason up one night alone by himself. He evaded the Secret Service, 
went to Gleason's home, picked him up, took him to Homestead Air Force Base, and took him into a highly classified area uh, through all the guards. I guess if you were a guard and the President of the United States wants to see something, you don't stop him. But anyway, the story was that he took Gleason into this room that had preserved uh, UFO occupants, uh, the typical four-foot-high, uh, big head, uh, almond-shaped eyes uh, occupants. And uh, she said when he came home, when uh, Nixon dropped him off at home, he was extremely upset and started drinking very, very heavily. Now, Clayson was known to uh, be well into his cups a lot of the time, so uh, this must have been uh, unusual. Uh, uh, for Gleason. So, in any case, uh, that story has a lot of uh, different uh, tales attached to it. One of them is that Nixon didn't pick him up, but a car was sent to pick him up and took him to Homestead. Another was that he was flown to Eglin Air Force Base. I think it was Eglin. And that's where he viewed these uh, uh, beings. Uh, and there's several other stories. And, you know, how, what's true is uh, very difficult to say. But I think that there is a element of truth to the story uh, uh, because we know uh, that we now know that uh, Nixon was on the road to disclosure and this is as per uh, my friend Bob Emmenager who made the documentary uh, UFOs past, present, and future that was uh, brought about by the White House uh, through a gentleman named Paul Charter, Charter who was uh, in charge of the Air Force uh, video tape uh, depository. Uh, which happened to be an old double uh, uh, ACP, which is air defense control blockhouse, which was uh, decommissioned uh, around the country, and uh, uh, it was turned in in California. It was turned into a climate control depository for. UFO films, and they, he and his partner, Bob Emmenager and his partner, were uh, told that if they would make this documentary on UFOs, uh, they would be given some 600 feet of movie film that was shot at Holloman Air Force Base of a landing of UFOs there. Uh, now, there, that story varies, too, about whether uh, uh, Nixon, I mean Eisenhower, was present at that time, whether he went out and got 
walked into this spacecraft, which I highly doubt. I don't think the President of the United States was going to walk across the tarmac and get into this uh, UFO. Uh, I don't think the Secret Service would have let him do that. Uh, but I think that there's the basis of the story is legitimate. There are a lot of witnesses to that story. So uh, don't mean to get off the subject, but that's that's uh, uh, how that film came about. Now, before the film was made, uh, uh, Bob Emmenager was... Uh, contacted by his White House contact, Paul Chartle, who was in in charge of the film depository for the Air Force, and told, we're sorry, we can't give you the film that we promised you uh, because of the Watergate scandal and the president is now deeply involved in that and we don't think that the this would now help him uh, uh, rather it would hurt him so the film was uh, not given to them but they were told that they could go ahead make the documentary and uh, put an uh, ending that is uh, uh, that was uh, uh, sort of made up of uh, uh, characters that were uh, drawn, sketches of characters that were that were drawn uh, uh, to replace the film of the actual landing. I think, personally, and I've spent time with Bob Emmenager, uh, and he's gone through the whole uh, process, the whole scenario with me, uh, and I believe that uh, I believe that what he says is is accurate. Uh, I think they were promised that film. Uh, and uh, because of Watergate, uh, we may have been living in a bit of a different world. Because if Nixon's uh, popularity, and you have to remember that at that point, Nixon's popularity was like 60%. Uh, and he could do, he had a license to do most anything he wanted to do. Then when Watergate uh, reared its ugly head, uh, that all came to a screeching halt, as, uh, as we know. But I think that Nixon was on the verge to making some level uh, of disclosure, very possibly major disclosure. Uh, and as I said earlier, if that had happened, if Watergate had not occurred, uh, we could be looking at uh, a UFO issue that is totally different from what it's been. So when you go through the path, and let's let's pick it up to the current side of the presidents, where we have Biden, Trump, uh, Obama, and uh, Bush, and then Clinton before that, they always used to laugh off the whole UFO subject prior to 2017 and when the New York Times article came out. Now all of a sudden when we see... Uh, Obama, for instance, going on on Jimmy Kimmel, or he all he wants to do is talk UFOs, you know, and what he knows. I mean, to me, when I saw that Obama interview where he was describing the the 
technological uh, sources of the Tic Tacs of what they were doing and their capabilities, I'm like, this is a man who hasn't rehearsed this speech. This is a man in the know. And to me, it really showed that he was lying to the public regarding the UFO phenomena. But all of a sudden, now he could talk about it. Do you, are you getting that that feeling too, or are we all speculation still? Uh, no, there's no question about it. As far as Obama's concerned, um, uh, what he uh, said on Jimmy Kimmel uh, really was public knowledge. But coming from a president uh, made it the impact of it great because no president had ever acknowledged the fact that these objects existed so for him to say it that had come out in the new york times and all of that so him for him to say it uh, was not in itself news but the fact that a former president of the united states said it was big news uh so i i think that's where it's uh very important now uh, we've obviously since i wrote the book uh there have been uh new things that have popped up that involve the presidents uh that uh, was not in the book because they hadn't happened yet. And that's one of the problems of writing uh, a historical uh, uh, book where the events are still going on. You know, it's it's not like you're writing about the Second World War, which ended it, uh, or anything else of that type. Writing about uh, the presidents and UFOs, uh, uh, the history of that is uh, difficult because they're still making history. Um, let's take uh, George W. Bush. Uh, when George was uh, George Bush was in office, he was asked about UFOs, and I don't remember exactly what the reporter asked him, uh, but it was about UFOs. And Bush simply said, go ask Cheney. Well, uh, that was a blow-off, but on the other hand, Bush was certainly occupied with uh, the aftermath of 9-11 and, uh, and uh, what was going on in the war that uh, that he committed American troops to and what have you. So that's not too hard to understand. After he was out of office and he was on Jimmy Kimmel's program, um uh, uh, Jimmy of course asked him about UFOs and I think the I think it was something along the lines of uh, when you were president did you receive files and briefings uh on the on UFOs did you did you have were you given the uh, the real scoop on UFOs? And, of course, you would think that uh, the his answer would be, uh, no, no. Now, they, they did ask Cheney about it. And uh, a reporter asked Cheney about it on the radio, I believe. And Cheney said, if I... Uh, the question was, have, were you involved in uh, meetings concerning UFOs? And uh, Cheney's reply was, if I was, it would be top secret, 
and I couldn't talk about it. So now Bush on Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel in us asked him the same thing. But did you get files and were you briefed and do you know uh, the files from the CIA and on the UFO issue? And uh, Bush said, you know, my daughter's asked me that same question. And uh, people laughed. And, and Kimmel said, uh, did you tell him? And Bush said, no. <laughs> so then uh, he went on and I I. I my recollection was that uh, uh, Bush really would just soon get away from the subject. But Kimmel said, well, are you telling me that, I forget his exact words, are you telling me that uh, this didn't happen or it did happen? And Bush looked at him and said, I'm not telling you nothing. And everybody broke out in laughter. Uh, here again, he could have written it off by saying, I don't know anything about the subject. Or it was never discussed. So just kissing it off. But uh, in essence, what he was saying was... Uh, uh, the subject was real, but he couldn't talk about it, and he wasn't going to talk about it. So, uh, you know, that occurred. Then you had what Obama had to say. Uh, as far as, uh, well, as far as Trump goes, um there is reason to believe that he was told a fair amount. Uh, just listening to him when he was questioned about it and his body language and his, uh, his answers on the surface was saying he didn't, think anything really of it but the way he answered it indicated at least to me that he knew a lot more about it than he was he was indicating um as far as biden i don't think he knows anything about it and i don't think he wants to know anything about it um uh, i I just, I don't think that the intelligence community uh, trusts him. And uh, so I doubt that he has been briefed to any extent. Now, that's to say that all presidents need to know, have to know, a little something about the subject. But I think. Uh, Biden probably knows less, uh, uh, the current administration knows less about the UFO subject uh, than any previous president. Do the presidents get a choice on whether or not they want to know on certain subjects like this? Do they get a choice? Yes. Uh, no. Uh, Clinton tried to pry uh, information out of the uh, intelligence community, out of the CIA, uh, National Security Agency, and whatever. Uh, and he couldn't get it. Uh, Hillary tried to get the information uh, for the Rockefeller Initiative. Uh, she was involved in the Rockefeller Initiative. Uh, she didn't get it. Now, it does appear uh, that in his later terms, uh, or his later term, 
uh, he probably did find out a fair amount about it. Clinton, I'm talking about. Uh, but initially, uh, he wasn't uh, given that information. So it's not up to the president. It's not the president's call. I'm going to get it's, you to hold on right there. When we come back, we'll finish this. we got to get into your personal experiences. Larry Holcomb is here tonight. Brand new book, Presidents and UFOs. We're going to continue on Spaced Out Radio in the final hour next on the Mighty SOR. All right, boss, we're clear. All right. Sorry about that. I hope I'm giving your uh, your folks some information that they... Uh, You've been great. Uh, it's been helpful to them. Uh, you know, it's such a complicated subject. Dave, it's just oh, I know it's 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 there's so much to talk about, and uh, you can go in one direction and ended up ending up going in the, another direction because it's it really is. I mean, you you know, you got UFOs, uh, extra terrestrial entities, abductions, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. It's such a, it's such a complex uh, issue. And the government, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, I am a great fan of our military, of the Air Force, the Navy, all of our military. But I think the Air Force was absolutely incompetent uh, the way that the UFO issue was handled uh, after Roswell in, into the 50s and the 60s and 70s, I guess. I mean, they... They told such ball faced lies uh, that it's, uh, you know, it, it, how do you, how can you trust anything that anybody says when you know they're lying? Uh, and the Air Force certainly did lie. Uh, oh. You know, we probably don't have time to get into it, but the uh, uh, Project Blue Book uh, Special Report 14, uh, Donald Quayle, Secretary of the Air Force, went to a news conference and, and just told bald-faced lies uh, about what the uh, Batille Institute uh research had done on UFOs uh, where they had studied 3,201 cases, you know. You know the, you know the story, I'm sure, but, uh, behind that. Uh, but he just lied about the, the fact that, for instance, there were, you know, he said there were 3% of the cases were uh, uh and explain could not be explained, but they had the worst witnesses of all all of the cases. The exact opposite was true. It was twenty one and a half percent couldn't be explained, and they had the best witnesses. So it was, you know, it was just a a ball face lie. You know, people you can go online now and see uh, Project Blue Book. Special Report 14. Look it up for yourself. Uh, so, this is a history of that, what the Air Force has done. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write my book, to don't, show don't the people. You. Don't hmm? blame you. 
Uh, yeah, well, to show the people the real background behind the UFO issue and how the uh, the government and the military handle, has handled it. Uh, I keep talking about the Air Force, but the Navy is probably more involved in the issue than the Air Force has been, uh, although they really keep quiet about it. Uh, but... Uh, Anyway, like I say, you can talk about this subject for hours and hours and still not cover uh, much of it. One second here, boss. Now we're all caught up. Once we get uh, through the next break, boss, what I will get you to do is just sit through the break. I will get back to you as quickly as I can to say a proper good night to you. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. And uh, we're going to come back here in just a few seconds. And thank you to Cat uh, Chaser and Flash Forward for the awesome super chats tonight. It's a great way to support what we do on the show. Here we go with hour three, everyone. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Echopraxia. Echopraxia is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clams. That's the password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we bring in a man of 60 years of UFO research. And Larry Holcomb has a brand new book out called Presidents and UFOs. What do they know in the White House regarding this very intriguing subject? Larry, welcome back. Good to be back. One topic that we haven't hit tonight is your own experiences. And I'm curious... (laughs) Have you ever been face to face with an extraterrestrial or UFO? Well, uh, yes, uh, but it wasn't the uh, uh, typical uh, UFO that you would uh, yeah, that you think about. Uh, it, although in uh, my later years, I've come to realize that these these things are also uh, part of the phenomenon. Um, to set you up, I was uh, I had a home on a uh, tributary 
of the Great Wacomico River, which is a which is a river that uh, ran off of the Chesapeake Bay, and it was between the Potomac River to the north and the Rappahannock River to the south. Very beautiful, pristine uh, river, and I was on a little creek called Balls Creek. Uh, my home, uh, which my brother is an architect, designed for me, uh, for us, my wife and I, uh, uh, it was one story on the front, but it was a sloping lot, and it was two stories on the back. And on the uh, uh, back, a lower level, I had my office, which had uh, a large uh picture window with two casement windows, one on either side. So my desk was under the window, and I could look out onto the creek, Balls Creek. And uh, at the time, I was uh, watching a bunch of little ducks, magansas, that were swimming on the creek. This is in the wintertime, probably February. And I'm guessing about uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I was there alone. Uh, on the other side of the creek was a cove. There was a point that the uh, uh, creek came around. And uh, I was looking, uh, facing toward this cove on the backside of the creek, which had a very large tree, uh, uh, probably an oak tree. It wasn't a pine tree. It was, it was something else. But anyway, a very large tree. And as I was watching these ducks, I noticed that there was a large bird, which was probably an osprey, uh, uh, circling over top of this uh, large tree in a very, very tight spiral. Just, uh, you know, like maybe five feet in diameter. Uh, and as I watched this bird, I noticed a rustling in the tree branches. Now, there were no leaves on the tree, but it was a very thick tree, and it, and it had, uh, uh, very thick branches, and so I couldn't see what was causing the rough, uh, rustling. And I thought perhaps that there was a bird that was caught in the limbs of this tree, uh, as happens quite frequently there, where fishing lines, monofilament lines, get tangled up with seagulls and, and ospreys. And I thought maybe that was where this frantic rustling was coming from in the top of this tree. As I watched it, Rising out of the tree was a orb, uh, a, a sort of a teardrop-shaped orb that was, I would say, from that distance, it was probably five feet across and uh, maybe seven feet in height. This was 1995, so it's hard for me to remember. And as this orb, which I will describe it as a hot air balloon, a little hot air balloon without any basket below it. Now, that's what it was shaped like. And it rose up. It rose on up. It went floating up like a balloon. So your mind is trying to figure what you're looking at. And I was thinking, well, uh, you know, it's probably a weather balloon. But then weather balloons come down. If they come down, they don't go back up. And they don't 
create a rustling in the trees. So this object floated on up to about tree level, just above the tree level. Uh, and uh, there were high banks on both sides of this uh, uh, this creek. I hope we don't lose power because we're going to have a bad electrical storm here. But anyway, uh, as it rose up, it started drifting horizontally. It didn't continue to rise, as you would expect. If the wind currents got it and pushed it this way, it rose up to a certain level and stopped and started moving uh, laterally, which I thought was very unusual. And I was still thinking, well, maybe this is something from the uh, Patuxent River Naval Air Station, which is the Navy's uh, flight test center, uh, which is only about 25 miles as a crow flies from where we were. As I watched it, I could tell that it was moving, uh, rotating on a vertical axis, slowly rotating. And as I watched it, all of a sudden, a beam of brilliant light, as bright as the sun, maybe brighter, hit, came off of the object, and it, it appeared to be hitting me square in the face, but it was only for uh, a second or so. Then it went out. I'll continue to watch it. It was continuing to rotate again, a second beam of light. Very brilliant, intense light came off of it. And that happened a third time. When that happened, I left my desk downstairs, ran upstairs very quickly uh, to get binoculars which was on my wet bar in the uh, great room, went out on the deck to look at it through binoculars, but it was gone. Now, that is not the greatest UFO story in the world, I know. And that's why I really uh, have been hesitant to talk about it. But I can't explain it. Whatever it was, it was a UFO. Now, whether it was a uh, whether it was military, uh, uh, I I don't know. Uh, it's it's we have where we were located then. There were military installations all around us. Uh, Norfolk, you had Naval Air Station, Norfolk, uh, then. Patuxent River, as I mentioned. Uh, 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 anyway, there's numbers of military uh, installations uh, uh, in Tidewater, Virginia. So I don't know what it was, uh, but that's what I saw, and I will have to say that it was uh, has been in bossed in my memory. Uh, it's something I'll never forget. Uh, so uh, that's not a very sexy story on UFOs, but it is uh, it is my only observation of what I would consider to be a, uh, a UFO because I couldn't identify them. I want to ask you in regards to these uh, these subjects of UFOs. How much do you think in the sky we are seeing human craft, or we are seeing some sort of of alien craft, like the TR three Bs or the black triangles, said to be the same thing? Dave, if if the 
craft that are being viewed and that we have tape of now. Uh, and our government says they have no idea what they are. And if that's the truth, and they are uh, something of a terrestrial nature, uh, we as a country are in deep doo-doo. Uh, uh, because if we have an adversary, Russia, China, that has moved so far ahead of us, uh, we're in trouble. That's why I don't think that it's anything that's manufactured, uh, on, uh, terrestrial earth mm -hmm. do you think there are aliens walking among us uh, a lot of people do I don't know it's certainly possible I mean we're dealing with a subject that uh, probably we can't even imagine uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, so, do we have aliens uh, in the population? Uh, again, I doubt it, but I don't rule it out. You know, you can't rule anything out uh, in this subject, really. Uh, you can be skeptical, as I, I think I said earlier. Uh, I'm a skeptic of many things that are claimed uh, in uh, ufology uh, that I just don't think are reasonable uh, uh, or they is factual. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, uh, it's 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 possible. I would come down on the side without knowing anything that 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 it probably isn't. But uh, you know, I don't know. I don't. It could very well be. Uh, when we find out the facts, uh, if we ever do. Uh, uh, we'll know, but I, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't say. Yeah, it, it's definitely one of those questions that I think is a lot of on people's minds right now, considering we don't know where these craft are coming from. We don't know if, you know, these, these beings are on board. If, is it imagination? I think the government has done a fair job over the last little bit here in really, really pushing the notion of segregating aliens from UFOs with this new UAP term that we've learned of over the last few years. What do you think about that separation? Uh, separation, uh, uh, if I understand your question, uh, I can rephrase if you want. Yeah, do that. I'm, I'm not quite That's sure. Okay. Uh, That's okay. We got about six minutes left. What I've seen is we're through since 2017, we're not really allowed to talk UFOs and aliens in the same conversation. It's, it's a separate conversation because UFOs or UAP is unidentified aerial phenomena. It has nothing to do with an extraterrestrial type presence. Uh, that's correct. Um, the, the question is, excuse me again. That's okay. Uh, uh, the the question is, uh, do we? Now, 
I lost my uh, train of thought, but uh, in in regards to separating UFOs from extraterrestrials, from extraterrestrials, uh, it's you know it's hard to say. Are these craft occupied? Uh, I've come to the belief now that they probably aren't. They are probably uh, probes of some fashion that highly uh, advanced uh, a race of, or races, that's, uh, that's something else that we haven't talked about. But, you know, in this subject, we are not, pro- we are not, more than likely dealing with one entity. We may be dealing with a major entity and a group of uh, others uh, at various levels of uh, uh, advancement. You know, you we may be, we may have some visitors that are uh, 500 years more advanced. Uh, we may have some that are, excuse me, 10,000 years more advanced. And uh, we have maybe the main group, uh, or excuse me, I got the hiccups for some reason, are perhaps a million years more advanced. So we could be dealing with all nature of uh, uh, entities at various levels of development. Uh, And that I believe, that I believe uh, sincerely. How do we deal with this going forward? As the public becomes more advanced in this subject, the mainstream media has taken this subject from being a Saturday or Sunday night final story to top story on a, on a weeknight. We see mainstream media doing a lot to cover this now, and the public is becoming a lot more interested in this. How do we continue to, to develop the idea of of what is real and what is fake in the information we are getting. Because one of the things that I have noticed over this time is there really seems to be a narrative that is being pushed through here regarding the subject. And a lot of people today are falling for that narrative. So I'm curious your thoughts with about two minutes to go. Um. Well, if I understand your question, I'm uh, where we where we st- what the uh, what the population believes. Uh, uh, where we where we are uh, in uh, this area of disclosure uh, is uh, uh, moving ahead rapidly uh, and it's it's gaining momentum if I'm answering your question uh, exactly Uh, it's it's we're seeing that the population has uh, taken the uh, fact that we have extra uh, terrestrial craft uh, as being very believable. Uh, And they do not uh seem to enjo- endorse so much the uh uh a fact or belief in extra 
terrestrial of beings. Now, how you separate those two, I'm not sure. Well, but uh, I, huh? I think that's where we're going to have to leave it, boss. I appreciate you, Larry Holcomb, coming on Spaced Out Radio. I hope you had a very good time with us and our audience tonight. And thank you for writing presidential presidents and UFOs. Well, I appreciate you having me here. I'm sorry I ended up with a case of the hiccup. That's okay. For some reason. But uh, uh, that happens. That's okay. Yeah. Larry Holcomb, everybody. Coming up next, I'm going to warm up the Magic 8 Ball. Let's see what you got for questions, audience. We'll be back on Space Out Radio right after this. Great show, boss. Great Thank show. You. That was fantastic. Well, uh, you are a excellent interviewer. Uh, good questions. Uh, uh, I really I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, you stumped me a couple of times, but uh, other than that, uh, uh, it was uh, it was very enjoyable. That was a yeah. lot of fun, a lot yeah. of fun, and and what a blessing for us to have uh, to have you on the show. I mean, sixty years in in the UFO world. I mean, you're, you're a legend for a reason, my friend. So thank you. Well, thank you. I I did thoroughly enjoy it. So I I hope I g- gave your uh, viewers, you listeners, something. You really did. Thank you, boss. I'm going to let you go get some sleep because I know it's one right. thirty in the morning where you are. So, really appreciate you. Okay, and you take thank care. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, and thank uh, all your listeners. Appreciate you. Take care. Right. Bye now. Bye bye. How fantastic was that, everyone? How fantastic was that, Randy Lloyd? Welcome to our chat room. How are you? And uh, we'll we'll put you up there, right there. All right. Magic Ape, oh, there's the man with the greatest name in, in YouTube land, Dry Toast. Dry Toast. Warming up the eight ball. Who's going to be first out of the gate tonight? Questions in three minutes. Three and a half minutes. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah, I would love to bring him back. Love to bring Larry back. Jason Pearl, welcome to our chat room. Owner, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. No, I just switched him up. That's not a new one. We got about two minutes here. That's a good answer, Jazz. Your teacher will score you an A plus if you answer all the questions, Chad Smith.
Questions in all caps as it's coming up here in about 45 seconds. We're going to start taking questions for the Magic 8 Ball. <clears throat> so make sure you get it ready, guys. It's all on you. I'm warming up here. Gogo has been to about 46 Bieber concerts. Guillermo, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for subbing, Jason. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Flash Forward and Cat Chaser for the Super Chats tonight. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And, uh, yeah, we're going to get going right now. Round of third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Want to remind you that if you missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's this time of the week once again where we bring in the Magic 8 Ball and get a little psychic with you all. All right, we're going to start things off, all audience questions here, with the Magic 8 Ball. We've shaken it up. It is ready, warmed up, and rocking and rolling here. Our first question of the night goes to Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. She always likes her name said three times. And will Teresa, in our chat room, ever get to go to a Justin Bieber concert? Yeah, she's addicted to Biebs. Good Canadian kid. Plays a little hockey, even though he cheers for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, I guess everyone has their flaws. But here we go. The answer is yes and beyond. Teresa will get to go to another Bieber concert. All right, Guillermo is asking, do we live in a simulation? I never know what to think about this question. Simulation or not, what the hell do we do with it? Let's see what the Magic 8 Ball says. As I see it, yes, we live in a simulation. All right, let's see here. Let's go to one of our newest listeners in the chat room, Coral Karen, Karina D. There we go. Coral Karina D. Will I continue to see UFOs for years? Hmm. The answer is my sources say no. Take advantage of it while you can, because sometimes, much like me, damn things just shut off their lights and fly on by. So, take advantage of it while you can, Coral, because we want to make sure you get lots of sightings out there. Nice hair, by the way. Very nice hair. All right, another one with nice hair. We got Joe in California. Beautiful hair on Joe. He is asking, is lunch for dinner okay? Don't count on it, Joe. Come on. You're pushing the limits there. Breakfast for dinner is bad. It is wrong. Lunch for dinner, that's just going uh, right around the corner. Can't do it. Can't do it. Lazarus is asking, Magic 8 Ball, do some aliens wonder if humans exist? Hmm, that's a good question. Very good question. 
You may rely on it. There's some school way up there in the Pleiades talking about these weird human-like creatures that are on this planet called Earth. And they may be real. All right. Coral again. Oh, the rookie's getting in there. A couple of questions. Can aliens know what we think and feel? All right. As I see it, yes, says the Magic 8-Ball. And I would agree with this. I would totally agree with this. All right. That's a good answer. Good solid 8-Balling right there. All right. Over on Twitch, Zed Batgirl, because I'm Canadian, Zed Batgirl says, what hockey team do you like? So far, we agree on the Leafs. Well, my original love is the Edmonton Oilers since 1979. I was like six, seven years old. First time I saw Gretzky play on TV, and I fell in love with the Oilers because of Gretzky. But during my journalism days, when I worked in radio, I covered the Vancouver Canucks a lot over seven years. I went to nearly every game, and I became a very big Canucks fan, too. So the Oilers are number one, Canucks are number two for me. And I haven't seen a Stanley Cup in a long time. Never in Vancouver. One day, maybe it'll change, hopefully in my lifetime. But at least I'm not a Leafs fan. That's all that matters. All right, let's go to Magnus. Is breakfast really acceptable for dinner? Magic 8 Ball. Sensors read no. Sensors read no. You should not eat breakfast foods for dinner. There's a reason why they are called breakfast foods. I tell you guys all the time. You should believe me. Now the Magic 8 Ball has said this. Breakfast foods are not for dinner. Therefore, no more eggs, you know, fried eggs or scrambled eggs and hash browns and pancakes for dinner. Sure, it's fantastic. It's a great meal for breakfast. But we got to get out of this breakfast for dinner stuff, people. Got to get out of it. All right. Chad Smith is asking, did Jazz in our chat room really go to sleep finally or is he still lurking? I don't think he went to sleep. Did he go to sleep, Magic 8 Ball? Signs point to yes. Yes, he grabbed his little teddy bear and went to sleep all, all cuddled up. Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. You need to subscribe to World Bigfoot Radio on YouTube. Fantastic channel. Is asking, should I retire from field research? My answer right off the bat, Duke, is no. We'll see what the eight ball says. The eight ball says, all clear. All clear for you to continue. That's what I get out of it. So no, you're not retiring, Duke. Not allowed. Not yet, at least. Alien Critter is asking, will Dave encounter a beautiful female Sasquatch in the forest? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. In hypersleep. Mm. Really? That could go either way. It's kind of negative. Chances are it's not going to happen. But that's okay. I will continue the search. The lovely Jennifer Hawkins in our chat room is asking, Will this winter go well? I hope so. Intel looks good, Jennifer. Intel looks good for you. Hopefully that continues. All right, Wit is asking, will there ever be an alien hockey team? The N-E-T-H-L. Well, hopefully they like fighting, because I'll tell you, the NHL sucks today as it's turned into soccer on ice. Go back to watching junior hockey, people. It's the only place to find it, both in Canada and the U.S. All clear. Good chance it's going to happen, Wit. All right, Teresa is asking, 
Magic 8-Ball. Will the fabulous Rano return to our chat room? I don't know why he left in the first place. In hypersleep means not for a while. Not for a while, Teresa. All right. uh, B. Hoff is asking, what about eating dinner for breakfast? That's just crazy. A lot more palatable than breakfast foods for dinner. Answer is, out of fuel, try again later. In other words, the Magic 8 Ball is done with asking questions about breakfast foods. All right. Nicola is asking, will the New York Jets win a game this year? They need a quarterback, man. And some defense. You may rely on it. My prediction is they're going to go 3 and 13. 3 and 13 to get the first overall pick. All right. Jim is asking Magic 8 Ball, should I change my underwear? Hmm. Have you flipped them yet? Gone to the clean side? These are questions we need to know, Jim. Magic 8 Ball says, My sources say no. You got a fresh side on the other side, so just flip them on over. You'll be good for another week or two. Coral is asking, Do aliens like the Earth's weird weathers? As I see it, yes, says the Magic 8 Ball. So, apparently they like it here. Apparently they like it here. Let's see what else we got from our audience and hmm scrolling on down all right magic eight ball is dave really shaking a martini inside of you i like martinis hmm answer is come on you have my pity for asking that, Jim. Magic 8 Ball, that's pretty much a no. There's no alcohol in the Magic 8 Ball. We're not shaking up martinis. However, it's still good. All right, moving on here. And Space Cow is asking the biggest joke question of it all. Will the Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup this year? Let's see if the Magic 8 Ball has a sense of humor and actually says yes here. Sensors read no. Sensors read no. They will not win the Stanley Cup. And the rest of us get to cheer them on for another losing season because TSN, Sportsnet, and CBC will all be screwed once again trying to figure out what went wrong with the Leafs season when they bow out of the playoffs in the first round and the rest of the country gets to cheer, chanting 67 once again. 67. Just feels good. Let's see, 67 plus 22. That's 55 years without a Stanley Cup. 55 years. How do you do it, Toronto? How do you do it? And how do you have so much hope every single year? My God, you win a game in the preseason, and all of a sudden you're lining up your lawn chair, saving your space on Young Street for the parade. Hilarious. Maybe that you finally named a captain, that'll work. Yeah, right. All right, B. Hoff is asking... If I asked another eight ball the same question, would you both give me the same answer? Eight ball doesn't like sarcastic questions, man. You know this. The answer is not today, Sheriff. Eight ball's not playing games with you, Beehoff. Not playing games with you. Wit is asking, does Bigfoot like the band Little Feet? I don't know. Intel looks good. They like the humor of it. To so check them out. Check them out. All right. We're waiting for more questions from our audience as we have a 
couple minutes left in this segment before we got to move on to the news. I want to know a question here. I want to know a question regarding UFOs. As you know, I'm going to save that one for next week. This one, though, because I'm going out to look to pick up some firewood this weekend. I got to go chop down some trees. I always feel good doing that. Magic 8 Ball. Will I find any Sasquatch prints when I go looking for firewood this weekend? The answer is, not today, Sheriff. Darn it. Hmm. All right. B. Hoff is asking, are reverse headstocks on guitars superior? Personally, I think they're ugly. The answer is all clear. Magic 8 Ball doesn't care. Magic 8 Ball doesn't care. Uh, Coral, I've already seen a UFO this year, a few weeks ago. That was kind of cool. All right, Sandra wants to know, will extraterrestrials give us new technology next year? Answer is, don't count on it. Don't count on it. We The public's always last. You know that. The public is always last. All right, we got time for maybe one, two more. Uh, Spooky is asking, Magic 8 Ball, will Dave and Samantha appear on 60 Minutes in 2022? I highly doubt it. Don't count on it, according to the 8 Ball. That sounds right. And let's see if we can get one more in here. Chad Smith is asking, do the boys at UFO Garage, another channel you should sign up for on YouTube, have actual UFOs in the garage? They may be hiding under Joe Strelsky's beard. I'm just saying. All clear. Means the garage is all clear. There is no UFOs in there. Sorry, Chad Smith. That's the Magic 8 Ball for this week. We're going to get to Shirky Poo's news right now. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire. At the back end of every show, we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the real estate. Yeah. So, you know the Conjuring house? All from the movie, The Conjuring? Yeah, well, apparently it is back up for sale. Jen and Corey Heinzen, who own the house in Rhode Island, have put it up for sale. Yeah, originally the Perrin family moved there and were literally haunted right out of the house for a number of years. We should get Andrea Perrin back on the show. It's been a while since we had her. Well, the 3,100 square foot home is back on the market and it isn't cheap, by the way. Full-bodied apparitions, ghosts, things moving where they shouldn't move on their own. It is deemed a haunted house, for sure. The asking price? $1.2 million. So if you want to own this piece of paranormal history, and you got some money behind you, this is the house to own. $1.2 mil. I don't even want to know what the mortgage payment is on that. The final frontier smells a lot like a NASCAR race, a bouquet of hot metal, diesel fumes, and barbecue. Dying stars are apparently creating this smell in space. The byproducts of all this rampant combustion are smelly compounds called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These molecules seem to be all over the universe, says Louis Alamandola, the founder and director of the Astrophysics and Astrochemistry Lab at NASA's Ames Research Center, and they float around forever, appearing in comets, meteors, and space dust. 
These hydrocarbons have even been shortlisted for the basis of the earliest forms of life on Earth. Not surprisingly, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons can be found in coal and even food. So the universe smells. From the northern Alaska Peninsula comes Autumn's burning question, who will be Fat Bear Week champion of 2021? Will it be Holly, former title holder and much beloved queen of the corpulence, or Chunk, the upstart that nudged Holly out of the final four last year, or perhaps last year's champion, a brawler named for a 747 jet plane, will be back for back-to-back victories. From humble beginnings in 2014, just for fun event, launched by Katmai National Park and Reserve, Fat Bear Week has grown into a nationwide phenomena. Last year, over 647,000 votes were cast to pick out the fattest bear of Alaska. I love this contest. And finally tonight, yeah, NASA's next moonbound astronauts will catch a ride to the launch pad aboard their Orion spacecraft atop a massive SLS rocket. Oscar Mayer, the food company known for hot dogs, would like to offer a bold and dignified vehicle to take them there. They want to offer up the Wienermobile to take the uh, astronauts to their rocket. NASA, actually looking for some new astronaut ground transportation, put out a call last week, and that's where the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile came up in conversation. I think they should do it. It would look great. Thought of the day, if today is as follows. I've started dieting again. Old Davey getting a little chunky. So what's your favorite junk food or fast food? Cherry picking. Krispy Kremes right now. Carlito. Potato chips or chocolate chip cookies. Andrew. Kale chips with Old Bay. If I got to eat kale chips on this diet, I'm telling you right now, I'm being fat forever. Horrible. Disgusting. 13 ballads. I'm on lettuce. Okay, lettuce I can handle. The gray. The question is, counter-constructive for you, Dave. Berries eating space cake. Cupcakes for Marilyn. Pizza and more pizza than dessert pizza for Nick. Lori wants some cookies. And let's see what else we got here. Hmm. Davey wants fish and chips. Classic British fast food. Vanilla meringue for Chris Desmarais. Danny, McDonald's and Hershey bars. Papa Murphy's pizza for Sparkles. Alex, pizza. And, yeah, pizza. Let's go over to the Dutchman Gary. Bacon chips with bacon and onion chip dip and a cold glass of iced tea. Very Dutch of you, Gary. Very Dutch. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the news. Everyone playing along on the Magic Gate Ball and Larry Holcomb for some great UFO history. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Space Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thanks to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Spreaker, Facebook, Revolution Radio, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends... We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.